Thank you. Thank you for your persistence. Are there any questions to what we discussed? Or do you want to ask me rather in the break? <laughs> That's also possible. Okay. So let me remind you what we did yesterday. We went up to the proof of this proposition, which is part of the proof of the classification of factor maps. Suppose xi equals gamma i modulo SL to R, i equals 1, 2, and those are finite volume quotients. Um, phi from x1 to x2 is a factor map <coughs> for the homocycle flow. It's almost everywhere defined and measurable, of course, and it satisfies that phi of x1 minus t, I think I used s yesterday, equals phi of x1 minus s. So it's equivariant for the homocycle flow. Then the final claim that we want to prove is that it's an algebraic map. It's actually, it's actually possible to move arbitrary elements in SM2R out almost everywhere. That's what we want to prove at the end, but we haven't gotten that yet. What we showed is that phi of x alpha alpha inverse, that's a default loss of generality. You may have to slightly change your factor map by conjugation by some element in the photosphere. Um, and then you can actually pull out the diagonal element. almost every x. And we showed even more. And we showed, let me get the order of the quantifiers correct, there exists an epsilon and an eta. Ah. I just realized that I'm different. For every eta greater than zero, there exists epsilon and delta. And the epsilon and delta are the epsilon and delta for the uniform continuity of this phi restricted to a Lusin set with the parameter eta. And the epsilon is related to the injectivity radius at most points in the target space. Um, and then there exists an x1 such that the measure of x1 is bigger than 1 minus eta. And for every t with absolute value t less than delta, and for every x and x1 one t1 one in x1, so those are two points in the domain, and they differ by the wrong direction, by the wrong polar cycle, for which I shouldn't know much. Then for these points, we know that phi of x 1 t 1 is equal to phi of x a b c d where we get we don't get yet that the a b c d is what we want it to be but we get some inequalities in the direction of that the absolute value of c is not much bigger than the absolute value of t, and the absolute value of t e minus a is not much bigger than the absolute value of t square root, and the absolute value of b is not much bigger than 1. And the idea for getting these inequalities was The, the two points are in the set of, con of continuity for the factor map. So this A, B, C, D is at least not big. So the B less less 1 is trivial from that. But then we, we said, let's just take a T very small and apply our unipotent that we understand to, this, to these two points. Then because the T is very small and it's a simple calculation, we realized that for a particular amount of time, um, about delta over square root of absolute value of t, um, 
these two points, the orbit of these two points stays close together. And most of this time we are in the set of continuity. That's our definition of x1. Which means that most of these times the image points should be close together. And if the ABCD doesn't satisfy this, that wouldn't be true. Because then we see many parabolas that are big most of the time. So we get these inequalities. And now I want to upgrade this to the corollary. that says, actually, um, there exists a set x2, measure of the set x2 is bigger than 1 minus 10 eta again. Maybe this was 10 eta, not eta, from yesterday. And then maybe this is 100 eta, um, such that on this set, A, B, C, D is equal to 1, 0, T prime, 1. So we get that the end that the T prime is not much bigger than the T. Let me define the set X2. X2 is the set x1 intersection, if you want to phrase it this way, the set of all point x such that 90% of the alpha alpha inverse orbit stays in x1. So it looks like I'm going to do the same as before. I'm just taking the, the displacement and start studying the divergence property of the displacement and get some arguments as before, except that I can't use the argument from the previous step. I can use this proposition, and that will help me. But just to emphasize, I can't use the same argument again along the geodesic flow, because along the geodesic flow of exponential behavior, and that doesn't behave like a parabola. And then the argument that if an exponential map is 90% of the time small, then actually algebraic conditions follow. That's not true. Because I could be, I could be close together for some amount of time and then explode exponentially fast. And here I have 90%. Here I have 10% of the interval where I really don't know anything about. And then I come back. The lattice brings me back, maybe. And I come back, and I see something like this. And again, 10% of the time I'm far away. 90% of the time I'm close together. And I could, could have many such intervals. And upshot is that. I don't get algebraic conditions along the flow of the geodesic flow if I know that two points are 90% of the time close together because they could explode many times along the way. For the parabola, that wasn't possible. So that's a feature of polynomials, a feature of rational maps that is very important in the whole story. So this argument we can't do, but we, we use the information that we got for the <coughs> from the horocycle flow together with this definition of x2 to conclude the proof. Are there any questions? Or are you still fighting sleep? Okay, how do we do this? Suppose x and x1, t1 really belong to x2. So both of these points are in the set x2. Then, of course, we have phi of x, phi of x1, t1 equals 
phi of x, a, b, c, d. And maybe, maybe I put here now index 0 because that's what I have when I didn't yet apply my geodesic flow, my element alpha, alpha inverse. Yes? Uh, sorry for interrupting at this point with this remark, but I just noticed that this, you have x1 and x2 on the left board there. Where? Left, left, left. Left, left, left. Or up. Yeah. Which has nothing to do with. Uh, in the proposition. In this proposition. X is, that is G or gamma. X has also some good sets inside x1. Ah, yeah, that's true. Thank you. That's confusing. <laughs> so the sets that I define are sets Ys and the spaces are X's. That's good. That's much better. So I have two points in the domain space for which I have the statement of the maximal ergodic theorem. 90% of the time I'm in the other set. And the other set, again, is the set coming out from the maximum ergodic theorem, but then for the whole cycle flow. So 90% of the time, something good happens along the geodesic flow. And the something good means I'm in a good set. And that good set says 90% of the time, something good happens for the whole cycle flow. And that's my definition of the set Y2. And now I have two points from this Y2. and I have this property, and then I, I replace my x and my, my x1, t1 along the geodesic flow. And this point, for most ends, this point is in y1. And the other point that shows up in this equation, phi x alpha to the n, this other point is also for most points in y1. And for points, whenever this happens, and the displacement between the two points is close and in this shape, then I get that this is equal to that with an A, N, B, N, C, N, D, N, where I get now constraints on the A, N, B, N, D, N, C, N, and the constraints are B, N in absolute value is less, less 1, D, N minus A, N in absolute value is less, less the square root of the new T, and C, N is less, less the square root of the new t. What is the new t? I need to calculate it by conjugation. And I assume my alpha, uh, stupid me. This is an a. And the a is, of course, the, the element that I have here. When I conjugate this element, I'm replacing t by alpha to the 2n t. And I'm assuming alpha is less than 1. That's the direction I want to go. I want to contract this guy. So my, my input, my input points, they actually get closer and closer and closer together. So the, the estimates that I have here, they get better and better all the time. And yeah, so the statement is I have dn minus an less, less, absolute value t, e to the um, alpha to the 2n, where I'm assuming that this is less than 1, and um, square root of that, and here without the square root. Those are the estimates from the green box. But applied for the, for the new points along the orbit. A priori, I don't know any relationship between A0, B0, C0, D0, and the new one at time n. 
because that's going along the geodesic flow and I just explained for the geodesic flow I can't repeat the argument that I had before. However, if I have such good inequalities and I have this displacement at time n, let's try to go back to time zero. What happens with this displacement if I go back, I increase the size of Cn, I don't change the size of A and <coughs> Dn, and I decrease the size of Pn. So this displacement is that displacement at time n by choice, and is, such, is in such a shape that when I go back for time n, I see a displacement that isn't big. But whenever it happens, it's the displacement even after conjugation. So after, uh, with this formula, I suddenly get the thing that I didn't know, namely that uh, a n, b n, c n, d n is really the, the conjugated A0, B0, C0, D0. And I can do this for infinitely many n's, for 80% of the n's in the future. That's my definition of the set Y2. Yes. That's the thing that I couldn't get out of just using the geodesic flow alone. And because I know that the, this element is so small, I argue backwards. Because this is so small in the direction that when I go backwards, uh, this direction is going to explode with precisely 1 over that speed which means it doesn't explode because it's so small that after conjugating it back, it's of that size, which isn't <coughs> because I use a small t. And the dn and bn, well, they don't change. So I can erase them somehow. They don't really. They, after I've done this argument, I can kill the index here because it's, it's the same along the way anyway. And and I see that the, the Bn, the C, if I go from time 0 to time n, the choice of my direction in the geodesic flow is that the, the Cn it gets contracted quickly. The Bn gets expanded. But now that I know that after conjugation, the Bn is still bounded. I conclude that the, that the B0 must be 0. And because along the conjugation, the diagonal elements, the diagonal entries of the matrix never change, but the estimate improves along the way, I realize that on the diagonal at once. Let me write it down and then maybe see it one more time. I, I know the proposition y1 from yesterday, which we obtained by going along the Hover cycle flow, and which gave us inequalities, not equations. Now I define the set y2 as the set of points that spend 90% of the time in this good set y1 that we talked about yesterday. I take two points that differ in this opposite direction that I'm interested in. And I study the, this, the displacement after applying the fine map, the vector map. 
and I have this inequalities for the for this displacement. But now I want to use the same statement for future times. And for future times along the geodesic flow, the t is much smaller because I use the direction where the t gets contracted quickly. And for most ends, I can use this statement. And for these most ends, I get precisely these inequalities, which are now improved inequalities because I have an input t which is much smaller than originally. And they are so much improved that I can take my nth matrix and conjugate it backwards. And it stays still bounded. When this happens, then the, the conjugated backwards matrix, which is a displacement at time zero, must be the displacement at time zero. So I get this equation that the, the displacement at time n is really the original displacement conjugated. But along the conjugation, I conjugate by the diagonal element, the diagonal entries are not changing. But the inequalities that I have on the diagonal, they are improving along the way. So d must be a, must be equal to 1. The bn has this inequality, but conjugated backwards, that means for b0 that it's alpha to the 2n small. <coughs> and I can use this for infinitely many n, so the bn must not be there. And the A0 and D0 must be 1. And the C0 I don't know. So I've proved this proposition that the image that phi of x1 t1 is equal to phi of x1 t prime of x and t1 that this must be true almost everywhere. You play around with the eta and then you get this almost everywhere. Which is a weird thing, right? I mean, how could it now not be so that this is also equal to t? That's what I want to say. So either this is equal to t all the time, and that's what we wanted to prove. We have to obtain an equivariance under the opposite horror cycle. SL2R is there, or we must find lots of points that differ on the graph. Let me write this down. Either we are done. prime x t is constant equal to t almost everywhere. Or we can find many pairs of uniformly generic points. one cross x two with displacement one t one that's in the in the domain space our displacement comma one t prime one that's the displacement in the target space with t prime not equal to t. All I'm saying is either it's true or it's, it's not true what we want to prove. If it's not true what we want to prove, we just take these tuples. We take these tuples of <laughs> generic points and start the same argument that we used in the beginning. Meaning we, we do the rational transverse divergence argument. But because the displacement is now so special, the calculation simplifies a lot. And the calculation simplifies and tells us that the fastest shear the 
fastest transverse divergence is in the first copy we used to make sure that we are transverse and the second copy we didn't know, we didn't know anything about and we don't this time we don't get invariance under the geodesic flow that's what I'm saying we get invariance under a vertical direction when I think of my whole problem was classifying the graph right the measure on the graph and there's a domain and there's a range and this is in the range direction and I'm invariant under the range direction graphs are not invariant under the range direction so we get a contradiction so we must be in the other case that almost everywhere the t prime is equal to t You need to write down the formulas again and then you will see that this comes out of it. Could you argue by conjugating with the geodesic flow? Somehow I changed both at the same time. I, I don't know how, how this helps me. And I can't, so that, that's the difference. If I have invariance on the unipotent thing, then I can use this transverse shear argument. Because then I'm talking about rational functions in the background. But once I already have obtained invariance on the geodesic flow, and I want to use trans and a transverse to that argument, it doesn't work because there's an exponential coming in from the geodesic flow. So the any questions to this? Yes. Maybe just uh, to refresh my memory about yesterday. Uh, yes. You, you start from two points in the continuity realm of, of phi, right? Yes. And then you know, and you assume that they differ by some displacement, which yes. is with this little t. Yeah. And then the displacement in the image satisfies these uh, inequalities. Yes. And these inequalities somehow smell like differentiability, almost. Not, not only continuity, because you say that the t also appears, right. it's not only an epsilon, it's the t that appears there. Yeah, but it's a hurdle, right, because the, yeah, the diagonal, yeah. So my question is, how, how could you remind us how you got these inequalities? I looked at the parabola, I mean, I just calculated how this thing behaves after, by conjugation. But I got it with the by, by the unipotent. Yes, by the unipotent. By the unipotent that we understand, the whole cycle, mm -hmm. the, the upper one that we Worked with from the beginning. So I conjugate this element by the power cycle flow, and I know that 90% of the time this remains small. No, I know that 90% of the time there is a displacement that is small. If it's this displacement that is small, then I get these inequalities that I wanted. But then we also said <coughs> if it's if the displacement keeps changing because the lattice keeps interfering. Then I get the following picture. Let's think of a compact space because so that we have uniform injectivity radius, otherwise I would have to make sure that I'm away from the cusp, etc. Um, so I have this following picture where I draw here the displacement, the size of the displacement. And here my time parameter, which is S. And the displacement is a parabola. So I get, maybe, I get this parabola. Maybe that's the parabola. But if that's the parabola, then I get these inequalities for the coefficients because a parabola that's small must have small coefficients. And there's a li linear coefficient and then there's a quadratic coefficient. So I get slightly different inequalities for the two. Or, and that's the wrong picture, I have a, at time zero I have a parabola which explodes and then pretty soon afterwards I must have a new small displacement because I know 90% of the time I have a small displacement. So I have a new parabola coming in and going out. And this is but that picture doesn't add up to 90% of the time I'm small. Mm -hmm. For the geodesic flow it does because exponentials can do this. 
but the whole cycle flow slash parabolas don't do that. So if I'm 90% of the time small, I'm like this blue parabola, which tells me precisely these inequalities. And now I'm using these inequalities for infinitely many n along the orbit of the geodesic flow, which makes the, the new displacements much smaller in certain directions. And it makes them so small that I can conjugate these new displacements back and compute that the conjugated back displacements are still small, which means that they are dead displacements at time zero. And because of that, I, I make out of the inequality of these equations, except for the direction that I'm inter currently interested in, the opposite direction. I don't get it there, so I have to possibly do another shear argument where I would end up in variance, in being invariant under the full horosphere, which is not allowed in my case. So that's the outline, the entropy-free outline of, of this particular joining classification. Good question. Is there another question? Then let me try to outline the, the general procedure that you want to follow for a given case, and that is sort of the strategy of the proof. But yeah, the proof that the strategy works in all cases, that's more involved. Uh, I have another question. So yes. you started this scheme by uh, considering joinings? I started with a factor map. I wanted. And at uh, some point, you, 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 yes, you move to factor maps only. Yes. Can you promote this? To, uh, uh, yes, you can, and that's one of. Uh, this was sort of the earlier, earliest paper of Marina Ratner in that direction, where you just start a factor map from an algebraic system to an algebraic system, to as quotient of S two to quotient of S two. Then you want to study more general joinings. I can give you an outline for that particular case first and then let's move on to the general classification. So what's a joining? A joining is something that's invariant under the diagonal horror cycle. Invariant endergodic under one S one one S one. It's not a horosphere inside S L two. And you you have a joining, which means that you uh, yeah. when you project the measure mu to the two copies, you get the two Haar measures on the two copies. That's another thing that you know, which tells you that the support isn't that small. In particular, it means there exist uh, sequences of generic points uniformly with displacements G equal G1, G2, not in the normalizer of our group. Because the normalizer of the group is too small, so if you're supported on the normalizer, you can't possibly be uh, adjoining. So you can start the, the transverse shear. argument this leads to additional invariance in some direction of the normalizer 
Now, the, the normalizer looks like this. We said it yesterday. Alpha, alpha inverse, star, cross alpha, alpha inverse, star. Two cases, maybe we are now invariant under. Ah, yeah. And in the transverse shear argument, we make sure that the limit rational function has a zero here. So maybe we are invariant under 1, 1, 0 cross 1 star 1. Maybe we are invariant under that. But then it's a whole sphere. And it's the trivial joining because it's now invariant under both the agrotic things. So, now. so that's, that's easy. Or we are invariant under the sum without loss of generality by conjugating. We are again invariant under the diagonal. So that's just as before. Maybe I shouldn't have reminded you of the whole thing because that's just as before. Now, there's something else you can do for this joining. Let's look at our joining measure. That's x1, that's x2, and here we have some measure, right? Some ground that looks maybe complicated. In the end, it doesn't look complicated, but maybe it looks complicated for a while. Then we can decompose it. This is a product of two spaces, right? We can just decompose it in terms of conditional measures for the fibers of the vector map to x1. So we get some conditional measures on x1 cos capital X2. Now there are two possibilities. Maybe this is not atomic. Maybe this conditional measure is not atomic. If it's not atomic, then we can find tuples of uniform and generic points that differ only in the second coordinate. But if they differ only in the second coordinate, it's pretty clear where you will shear into, maybe into the case where you have photospherical invariance. So if, if you're not atomic for this conditional measure, you end up with the trivial joint. So it's atomic. So we have uh, countably many, possibly countably many points on this fiber. And we take a typical point from, from this fiber and then move the conditional measures around. And we have an agotic action, right? So this point gets mapped to that point at some point. But that means that on on this atomic measure, this other point has the same weight as this point has. So we must have finitely many points on, in the fiber. And of course, at every place in X, this finitely many is the same thing. So now we basically have the same situation as before. Instead of having one map that we studied its continuity properties, we need to look at simultaneously n or k, some new parameters, k maps that together are well defined. It's a, it's a correspondence somehow. One point in x1 corresponds to finitely many points, fixed amount finitely many points in x2. And then you use the continuity properties of that in the same argument, same way. And this is also how Marina Ratner wrote her joinings papers. She said, now we do the same as in the previous argument. And you end up in showing invariance under the opposite corner again. Where always if something fails, you end up with the trivial joining. That's somehow the strategy here. Thank you.
you for the question. Another question? much this term can be used for this procedure. Ah. So this procedure completely classifies all invariant measures for the diagonal Hobo cycle flow on a reducible and a quotient by a reducible lattice. Because if you're not adjoining you are an, you are an even easier case. And the, if you have an irreducible lattice, then somehow you don't have this factor. And you can't use this factor and you can't use these conditional measures because there's no decomposition. And then you need to use entropy again. So let me outline the, I also wanted to do SL3, but I guess I'm not going to do that because of time constraints. But let me outline the general, um, scheme of attack and and then maybe return to products of SL2s because that's the case we understand very well now. But assume that we have an irreducible lattice where we can't use this argument with fibers and hence can't use yeah, the continuity properties of some map that we construct. Um, so general scheme. And that's the scheme of Magulis Tomanov, which yeah, at some, at some point wants us to say entropy really differs from the scheme of Marina Ratner. Um, let mu be U invariant and ergodic, or will the measure on X equal G mod L. And, and this, of, this U is, of course, unipotent. And maybe originally you're interested in just one parameter unipotent things, but pretty soon if you keep iterating the scheme, you will have to deal with multi-parameter unipotent groups. Okay. Um, lemma proposition. If mu is supported on a single orbit of n g u, then u is algebraic. Now, we basically proved that already. Because if, if you're supported on a single orbit of NGMU, take two nearby points. Then these two nearby points uh, have a displacement which is in the normalizer. But if you have two generic points that differ by something in a normalizer, then this difference preserves the measure. So the, the, that part of the NGU group that matters for the measure is fully in the, more in the stabilizer of the measure. So you conclude that you actually support it on one single orbit of the stabilizer. And that's precisely what we wanted. Then we have one orbit of measure one. Then and it's an orbit of a group that preserves the measure, so the measure must be the Haar measure of this orbit, and that's what we want. So this is the old, the, the easy step. And second case is then, if not, then <coughs> we find many tuples of uniformly generic points which 
with displacement um, G not in the normalizer. And if you're in this situation, then you cook up a rational function. By using different times along the one orbit and along the other orbit, you want to make sure that the, this doesn't grow in the direction of the group U. So you need some, some kind of transverse variety where, where this takes values in. And by this condition that this should be in a transverse direction, you define actually Sy in terms of Sx as a rational function, as we discussed. And this then converges up we choose a converging subsequence so that this rational function stabilizes to some limit rational function and you end up, ah, another statement is pretty easy to see but maybe I should say it that if you are in this situation where the G is not in the normalizer then no matter how you define the S Y um, no Let me say it uh, easy, in an easier way. And then we just need to take the converse, which is also true. Um, suppose G is in the normalizer. Then the weird way to phrase the fact that G is in the normalizer is the following. If G is in the normalizer and we choose Sx somehow, and Sy accordingly, you can make this again equal to G. If G is in the normalizer, then for every Sx there exists an Sy, so that this becomes equal to G. And that actually is precisely the statement that you are in the normalizer. And we define the Sy to make this outcome somehow as easy as possible, as simple as possible. So this rational function becomes the trivial rational function that is constant equal to G, if and only if your G is in the normal normalizer. But you are not in the normalizer. So this rational function is not the constant function. And because it's not the constant function, we can speed it up and make it more interesting. So we can choose a, a limit, any limit uniform on a certain compact subset will have values in two things at once in the normalizer and in the stabilizer of the measure. So when you say limit, you mean after time? We need to uh, use time lapse, yeah. etc., for speeding up. Then we have a sequence of rational functions that don't look more and more complicated, but also don't become more and more trivial, more and more constant. And then we choose a converging subsequence and have a limit rational function whose values preserve the measure and takes on values in the normalizer. And that it takes on values in the normalizer helps us to understand how this rational function looks like. Now if this, this new direction that we found, this is now and, and transverse and um, is transverse to you. So it's a new direction that we are invariant under. By that was the choice of Sy. We made Sy a function of Sx so that this is pointing in a different direction than the direction of u. So with all of these three things, we have a new invariance in a new direction. If this is a unipotent direction, we just go back to to step zero, increase the u by the new direction, and go through the same scheme. If new direction.
reaction is unipotent, then the increase U and So that means that in the second step, if we run into this case, we will have to define the notion of uniformly generic points for an R2 action and later on for some nilpotent, unipotent group. And we will have to talk about rational functions on R2. But you know, that's the scheme and that is not so frightening somehow. If you think of a particular case, it's, it's very easy to, to analyze what's really going on. Not so bad. And then there's the second case. So that was case one. Second case, not unipotent. Maybe it's some kind of diagonal direction and which you are now invariant. And then you would start using entropy. I have 10 more minutes or so. Is there any question to the general scheme? Or is it sufficiently vague that there are no questions? So when, when we saw the same with this limit, then we were somehow assuming that we had a complement, right? And we were, at least with the version we saw yeah. was when we were complement. But yeah. in general, you don't have that, right? Um, in the, the, so in the... I mean, just in the application of the H principle, we needed some transfer. Yeah, so here we're not talking about the H principle any longer because we're using different times. That's a different yeah. thing. And then, and we're doing that precisely because we don't have U invariant complements. So we cook up a variety that's not invariant, which is just a, a variety that's transverse to the group U that we're working with. And then we ensure by choice that, that the outcome should be taking values in this complementary variety, no invariance whatsoever. So, so the, basically the fact that we have these two parameters rather than one allows us to get yes. the trans so Yes, trans the dimensions match somehow. We want to be transverse to U, which is a, a co-dimension dim U yeah. constraint. And precisely. we define SY precisely in such a way that we are in this complement. So it's, it works out nicely. Yes? How do you know that uh, the, suppose you get a diagonal element? Yes. How, how do you know that the uh, U invariance contributes to the entropy of this element? I mean, why, why can't you in the limit somehow get uh, an, yeah, yeah, that's an uh, irrelevant an important diagonal. question. Yeah, that's an important question. Um, so if you are in a semi-simple group, then somehow A vague answer would be sort of Jacobson Morrison should should help you saying that that this is happening. Suppose you have a one. Suppose you are not yet high dimensional. Suppose you run into this case in for a G semi-simple with a one-parameter unipotent group. Then somehow the unipotent that you get. Yes. Uh, so here's the big difference between the Ragnar proof and the uh, Tomano Morgulis proof. In the Tomano Morgulis, what they show is that uh, when you do get a diagonal element, it would expand not the whole of U, but it would expand uh, the determinant on U somehow. So at least part of U would be expanded by it. At that point, after they find this diagonal element, they actually do a switch. They stop working with U, but work with the part which is somehow expanded with this diagonal element. 
Marina somehow really wants to work with uh, Jacobs and Morris or with this, uh, if she has one parameter group, she really wants to work with this diagonal which matches to this one parameter group. She really wants to do that. So even if the measure is invariant or not invariant, she's basically just working with this element and uh, at the end of the day basically forces the measure to be invariant at this particular element just by force of will. But, uh, <laughs> So the, the, this is exactly the difference. No, but, but what I ask is, is somehow in the beginning of what you said that that the, the your diagonal element must expand part of you. So why is that? Why in this limiting procedure can't you get some it's diagonal element? Because polynomials. This sharing is some kind of polynomials. Polynomials are unbounded. And if you look at the somehow. Uh, One uh, polynomial you could get is somehow how the, this um, Jacobian on U is going to be some, one of these polynomials. Just because the shearing is somehow given by a polynomial, it just has to expand part of you. So this is really, in some sense, the, one of the important difficult steps to ensure that to, to check precisely this condition that the diagonal element you get has this property that you expand at least a bit more that you are not the ident um, unimodular on the group that you previously had because then you can start using it too. so let me go back to the to the SL2 R cross SL to R case, but now let's assume that we have a irreducible lattice. And then the previous argument disappears. Where we talked about fact, the factor and the, the conditional measures on the fibers. Um, and we are mu is 1s1 cross 1s1 invariant. And in this next in the first application of the whole machine, if we end up getting variance under the unipotent, the new unipotent, then we are homospherical and we are done. So only remaining case mu is also alpha alpha inverse cross alpha alpha inverse invariant and now you can study the entropy of this guy this guy expands, contracts, whatever you, depending on the sign of log alpha uh, the group that we have and because we are invariant on the part of this homosphere the entropy of of this A diagonal element, which is the diagonal diagonal element now, entropy of this is positive. The entropy of A is what Elon and I call equal to the entropy contribution of A and G A minus, where you take the, the whole homospherical subgroup, but that again is defined in terms of a limit. As n goes to infinity, you need to take the. So A is your, your diagonal. It is this diagonal. Um, up to. Maybe you had to conjugate it first to get rid of this corner, who cares? But uh, uh, there's no other diagonal appearing which relates to something. <coughs> you had a normalizer. This is the only part of the diagonal that normalizes our group. So it really ends up very nicely in this situation. I think the first case where your question is relevant is when you start using a two-parameter unipotent group inside SL3 and then end up being invariant under a diagonal element. Then you have to ask the question why you see entropy for this diagonal element. Okay, so we need to look at the conditional measures of the measure in the direction of the horosphere. That's somehow 
I said that before, and it also features a lot in the discussion of, of Elon, that entropy is determined by the behavior of the measure with respect to the group action quotation mark. It's not really measure preserving. Group action by the along the uh, horospherical subgroup. That's what determines entropy. And then what you need to do is you need to take some ball inside this group, conjugate it a lot, and take the logarithm. And I guess I was shrinking my group, so maybe I take the absolute value, and then divide by n and look at the growth rate. That exponential growth rate of the conditional measure tells me the entropy. And we define that expression as the entropy contribution. And for the full homospherical group, the entropy contribution actually equals the entropy. But then it's also the entropy contribution of GA plus, where maybe you drop the absolute value. And otherwise, the definition is the same. That's the symmetry of entropy. I mean, if you take here plus minus 1, it's always the same, right? And that means I can change this to this. Now there are two cases to consider. We need to define a subgroup V, which is the opposite one that also featured in the previous discussion. Somehow, this group is opposite to our group. It's also not a horosphere. And there are two possibilities. Maybe mu x g a plus is supported on b, on this opposite group, or maybe not. <coughs> if it's supported on this group, then it, the entropy contribution of this bigger group is equal to the entropy contribution of the smaller group because the conditional measure lives on the smaller group. And from here, I, from the beginning, I knew that this guy has entropy because I have a one-dimensional group in the stable horospherical that I'm invariant under, which tells me that I have positive entropy. But actually, it tells me more than that. It tells me that I have entropy bigger absolute value log alpha squared. So um, I'm assuming this case now. And this assumption kicks in here in this equation. And then this quantity, this quantity is greater or equal log alpha squared. But that's one dimensional also. <coughs> and that's the maximal value that you could possibly have. Whenever the entropy contribution achieves, achieves the maximum value, you must be invariant under the group. That's sort of this entropy, strict convexity behavior of entropy. So in this case, the red case, you conclude mu is invariant under V. Well, the V is the opposite whole cycle of the diagonal SO2. We are invariant under SO2. And now we are done. Because once we are invariant on SO2, we already have established that it's algebraic, because SO2 is semi-simple. And then there's the or not case, which means that the conditional measure is having at least that much entropy, but is not, not concentrated on this one-dimensional, lower-dimensional line. And a priori, that could, could happen. Maybe, maybe up here in, the, in this corner, we have um, just this one parameter group as entropy. Meaning maybe we have here really equality, but on the other side, the, the entropy is more spread out, and then it's not forced to give you invariance because it's a two-dimensional group, and then the, the 
maximum value would be twice that. And then you don't get the invariance out of entropy. However, that gives you lots of points in very special relationship to one another. And you can start the shearing argument again. So let me say that more clearly. Um, so that's the second case. I'll give it a different color. Lots of points, lots of pairs of points. Uniform and generic, of course. With displacement. So you get pairs of points where n t prime not t not equal t prime. Because the conditional measure is not supported on, on this group. So you see points that differ by something from the opposite horosphere, but not from the opposite group. <coughs> you have such points. <coughs> and if you have one such displacement, you can conjugate the two points, you can apply the geodesic flow for the, to the two points and make this t and t prime get smaller and smaller and smaller. But they stay as not equal as they have been not equal in the beginning. But if you just keep changing your points in an arbitrary fashion, you might be afraid that in the limit, somehow t becomes t prime rather rapidly, much quicker than the two go to zero. But I'm actually taking one t t prime and making them simultaneously smaller and smaller and smaller. So they stay transverse to the direction of V. And because of that, I can put the, these tuples of, this sequence of tuples of points into the shearing argument and end up being invariant under the whole sphere again. So that's the, the whole procedure carried out for SL2 versus SL2. Thank you. So since we are a bit over time, I suggest we have the questions with the coffee, but yeah. let's not forget to uh, thank Manfred for this marathon of uh, how many? Eight, Eight lectures in uh, four days. <laughs>